We're going to begin the life of Isaac tonight, so I'll draw your attention to Genesis 25, and I want to read to you from verses 19 to 23. Genesis chapter 25 and verses 19 to 23, that's our text. This is the account of Abram's son, Isaac. Abram became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padam Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her and she said, what? Why is this happening to me? So she went in to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said unto her, Two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. Isaac is one of three patriarchs whose reputation and stories have been known for 4,000 years. Today they are known all over the world. They are Abram and Isaac and Jacob. They also are known to heaven because God identifies himself as the God of Abram and Isaac and Jacob. On no less than 30 occasions in scripture the trio is mentioned together. Of the three men it was Isaac who lived the longest, 180 years. Five years longer than his father Abraham. While his son Jacob lived until he was 147 years of age. People um, lived longer in those days because the effects of the fall had not yet been manifested in this world. Isaac lived the longest and least is known about him. It's about a century and we know nothing at all that happened during that time in his life, decade after decade. It's only in this chapter and in the next chapter that the Bible focuses on his life. Alexander McLaren said, the salient feature of Isaac's life is that it has no salient features. There's Abraham, child of a man, Isaac's father. There's Jacob, a fascinatingly complex man, Isaac's son. And between them there is this more passive figure of Isaac. I compare them to the Hodges of uh, Princeton Seminary. Abram is the giant, like Charles Hodge was. Jacob is like his son, the dynamic um, Archibald Alexander Hodge. While Isaac is like the enigmatic and quiet figure of Caspar Wister Hodge Jr. The great Hodge's grandson, the um, teacher and colleague of John Murray, the Hodge whose life is just, well, there's nothing to say about it. I preached 30 messages on the life of Abraham and I plan to preach four on the life of Isaac and that indicates the scale of importance between father and son. Men enter the kingdom of God not by natural descent, not because their fathers were big and important, but by a birth from above. Man's usefulness in the kingdom of God, it doesn't depend on the number of his IQ, or his family connections, or his glittering personality, but on gifts of grace that God bestows on him. And most of us are like Isaac. And that will then give us a, an empathy, an identity with this man. First thing I want to say is that Isaac and Rebekah were without children. Look at the wording in verse 19 of the announcement of Isaac's birth. This is the account of Abram's son, Isaac. Abram became the father of Isaac. And then go back seven verses to verse 12 and see the wording of the announcement of Ishmael's birth. This is the account of Abram's son Ishmael, whom 
Sarah's maidservant, Hagar, the Egyptian, bore to Abram. He was the biological father of Ishmael, his son by his wife's Egyptian maid, Hagar. She bore him a son. And that uh, grievous misjudgment is revealed to us in Scripture. It's past, it's acknowledged, but when Isaac's birth is announced, we are told, Abram became the father of Isaac. That is, Abram begat Isaac. Isaac is his beloved son, his only begotten son, with his wife Sarah. It's very interesting, when God comes to demand of Abram that he sacrifice his son Isaac, on Mount Moriah, that God says to him, he is your only son. Now, Abraham uh, may have had another son before, and then other sons after Isaac. The list of sons in the uh, opening verse of, uh, of this chapter of Isaac's, of Abraham's future sons, half a dozen of them. But in the most important sense, Isaac, was his only son. Or a difference between Isaac and Ishmael, his half-brother. Isaac is the seed. Isaac alone is the line of the woman who one day will produce the seed who will bruise Satan's head. All the promises of God have come to Isaac and through Isaac and to him alone. It will be through Isaac and his seed through that isthmus then that the hope of cosmic redemption rests. Ishmael world. He went off with his mother from the promised land. He went back to the land of his mother, to Egypt. And there he produced son after son. By the end of his life, Ishmael had twelve sons. How many daughters he had, we don't know. When forty-year-old Isaac marries Rebekah, then Ishmael already has many children. And when Isaac finally becomes a father, Ishmael is 73 years of age and has all his 12 sons. What good for Wales will be all the sons of Ishmael? Will Wales be blessed by one of Ishmael's sons? No, not one. Only through Isaac will all the nations of the earth be blessed. If Isaac and Rebekah have no children, then God is a liar and his promises are empty promises and the cursed world continues to revolve on its axis without any hope of regeneration and redemption. So when we get into the married life of Isaac and Rebekah, we discover I've been here before. We're on familiar territory. Here are echoes of the married life of Abram and Sarah. We learn that Isaac didn't marry until he was 40 years of age. Men generally at that time married when they were 20. His bride was the delightful Rebecca, whose age, as is the case with women, is never revealed. She is, was far younger, and that's all we need to know, the Holy Spirit thinks. It was an arranged marriage, it was a love marriage. And there was no one else for either of them. Abraham had children from three women. Jacob had children from four women. But Isaac had one wife, his darling Rebecca. He was the only patriarch who was monogamous. Though they were to have no children for the first 20 years of their marriage. He wouldn't take a concubine from his wife's servants. He was walking down the same path as his father having to wait, having to wait to have a child. But he rejected his father's ploy. Isaac would wait for his child to be conceived by his wife and until then yearn for the happy event but be full of trust, contented with God's will. God is sovereign. Almighty to give life and full of compassion. God had told him, God had told his father that they would have children. Isaac was prepared to wait. Year after year. Did it seem to him after 20 years had gone by 
that it was almost impossible that this promise would be fulfilled. Isaac kept believing God. As was a man of faith. He was like his father. He'd seen, he'd watched, he'd heard his father and his father's prayers. And he trusted God like his father trusted God. He believed that what God had promised him and his father, God would also fulfill. Well, we are mighty glad of that. The godly line is coming through one believing generation after another in those patriarchal times. Now I'm not saying that Isaac was a perfect man any more than his father Abram was a perfect man. In fact, he repeated two of his father's glaring mistakes. He lied too about Rebekah, saying that she was his sister out of fear of that old king Abimelech. He didn't tell him the truth. He didn't say, she's my wife, back off. And then trust that Jehovah would protect them. He made that mistake, just like his father had done it twice. And then he also displayed favoritism. He had one of his sons. Oh, he loved one of the twins. He loved Esau. And he strove with God that God's special blessing would fall on him and not on, not on his son Jacob. But God had explicitly rejected Esau. And in that, again, I'm saying to you, uh, Isaac is like Abram, because, oh, Abram loved Ishmael. In old age he had Ishmael, he had a son, and the, oh, he was a daring and a beautiful boy. And uh, Abram wanted God to put his hand on Ishmael and make Ishmael blessed and fill the earth then with the seed of the promise. I'm telling you that uh, Isaac's life wasn't a perfect life. And uh, so you can I, identify with him better, can't you? Because your life has been far from perfect. My life. Far from perfect. It's the life of a sinner. Who has to trust in, in the grace of God for mercy. And so Isaac was not the promised seed. He'll come. Oh yes, he'll come. In the fullness of time, he's going to come. He's going to come. But we have to wait all through these 39 books and then there's a gap. And then the new covenant comes. And he comes whom our souls love. And he's born in Bethlehem, the promised seed through whom we and Wales and every nation of the world is going to be blessed. Abram had to wait. Isaac had to wait. And we have to wait. We have to wait for the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour from heaven. We have to wait for him to come, for God to keep his word. And if I go, I shall come again and take you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And we are waiting, we are waiting patiently for that great day to come. So here's Isaac, and he's waiting by an empty crib for twenty years. And the words of his father ring in his ears, the Lord said to me, through our lineage, through me, and then through you, and the children that you will bear, the promised one will come, and all the nations of the earth, from pole to pole, from east to west, are going to be blessed. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Don't give up hope. Look how long it was that your mother and I had to wait. Abram, you see, was still alive when Isaac's twins were born. He was uh, 160 years of age when uh, he saw Isaac with uh, the boys in his arms. He saw and Jacob, and he saw them grow. Abram saw them reach their 15th birthday. They were on the verge of manhood, and Abram saw all of that. And for his wife to give birth, then Isaac waited, well, 50 years from the time that... Uh, he was laid down on an altar on Mount Moriah and the angel said, don't touch, don't touch the boy. And then God spoke and said, uh, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through, through this boy. 
And he knew then that uh, God's, God's plan for the world didn't depend on his fertility and strength any more than it had depended on his notable fathers. That the event was going to happen, though they were weak men, morally, they showed weakness, and they were weak men physically. But uh, God would do what he said he would do. It's a great message for us to learn as Christians that it doesn't hang on our ability and smartness and purpose and hopes, but it hangs on the promises of Almighty God. So we are introduced to Rebecca again here now after the wonderful courtship and marriage. And we're told about her. The first thing we are told was not that she was a beautiful woman or that she trusted in God. But the blunt words of verse 21, she was barren. Three words. And there's no reference in that verse to the anxiety and the concern and the frustration that her mother-in-law, Sarah, had endured. That takes about nine chapters in the life of Abraham to resolve the tension of the childlessness of Abraham and Sarah. Nine chapters. And I suppose we are to read that tension and that sadness into these three words. She was barren. It's not new. And so take it as read that not having children for 20 years wasn't easy for Rebecca any more than it had been for Sarah. Ditto, says the author of Genesis. If you want to know how she felt during those 20 years, well, consult the life of Sarah. So Rebecca, not the first woman in scripture to endure the test of barrenness. Sarah had to wait till she was 90. And then the mothers of Joseph and Samson and Samuel and John the Baptist were all going to be tested by long, long anticipation, long periods of childlessness, almost giving up hope of having children. Rebecca was someone who had every reason to expect children. God himself had encouraged her to know this. But a decade went by, two decades went by, while her biological clock was ticking. Now this was 2,000 years before Christ. These barrennesses in the wives of the first two patriarchs are preparing us for the coming of Christ. What do I mean by that? Well, how did this extraordinary man, Jesus of Nazareth, appear in the world? Where did he come from? The man of whom his hearers said, never man spake like this man. This man had power over the surface of a lake. He had power over the winds. If there was a tree, he could smite it and the tree would wither and die. He, he could heal every sickness that the world has ever seen. However, devastatingly, it had gripped someone that he was in the last stages of conquering that person and ridding him of his life. He could even raise the dead. He himself was risen from the dead on the, on the third day. How did he appear? How did he come into the world? You know what the New Testament, you know what the New Testament says. That he was born of a virgin. That the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. And, and so she conceived in her womb. She was begotten by God. It was beyond the plans of men, wasn't it? There were no virgins in Israel having a little society and meeting together and encouraging one another and saying, one of us is going to give birth to the divine divine man, the son of God. No one was saying that. It was an action totally beyond human engineering. You couldn't do it. You couldn't say, now is the time. We're going to bring the Messiah. God the Son is going to come into the world. 
Salvation belongs to God. The Savior is a totally vertical, sovereign gift of the grace of God to this world. And so people wait for it. They waited until it first is promised in Genesis 3.15 to Adam and Eve. And they wait again from Abram's time. They wait and wait for him to come. And then he comes. And I'm saying the waiting here is a, it's a good lesson to teach us. That we have to wait on God. We have to wait for God's time. And God's plans to be accomplished for 2,000 years then. From the time of Abram and Sarah having a child until Christ came. The promise hung over the world. Two millennia. Until then Israel's barrenness was over and ah he came. The Messiah came. The angels filled the fields of Bethlehem and announced that he had come. God kept his word. So that's the picture. Ah. Isaac and Rebekah are in middle age with no children. They've, ex they've received extraordinary promises. Um, Isaac could never forget the time when the angel said, Don't you sacrifice your son. I will multiply your descendants as the stars and the sand on the seashore. And that's the promise. He heard it himself from the angel. Heard it with his father. His father had told him it again and again. All nations. Wales is going to be blessed. He didn't know that. But we know that it was included. England is going to be blessed. Ireland and Scotland and Africa is going to be blessed. But here is Isaac. And he can't produce one. All the nations, the sands of the seashore, fast. One. He can't produce one child. And then there was Rebecca, and she could never forget the day that uh, changed her life. A camel train came into the village, and uh, she, as a godly young woman, then offered to give water to the camels and a drink to the servant, and soon he was asking her if she would return with him and marry his master's son. And so they all agreed and the relatives made speeches and remember the great speeches they made like they do at weddings and some of her relatives said to her, Oh sister, may you become the mother of thousands, of tens of thousands. That's what they said at her wedding day. May she become the mother of thousands, of tens of thousands and she can't produce one. Here they are. Under the sovereignty of Almighty God. What will Isaac do? How will he respond? Would he try his own devices and produce an heir like Abram did with Hagar in his lack of faith? Or will he cleave to the promises of God? Will he wait on God? Or will he get itchy feet? Second thing I want you to see in this passage before us tonight is that Isaac spread the matter of Rebekah's childlessness before the Lord. Alright, that's the second thing. You see that? Isaac prayed to the Lord. Verse 21. On behalf of his wife. He learned from his father. He had oh, that we learn from our fathers. That we learn from preachers. That we learn from the godly men. Whose books we read. Their biographies. The lessons. Isaac had more trust in God than Abraham. You know there had been a time. This is extraordinary. There had been a time when King Abimelech. Had taken Sarah. Abram's wife. Into his harem. Because. Abram had told him that Sarah was his sister and, uh, and not his wife. And God judged the harem, the household of Abimelech, remember? The whole child, the whole household became childless, barren. And then what happened? Do you remember what happened? How 
Abram prayed that God would lift that judgment. And he did, and then the wives then began to produce children once again. Even with that stark answer to Abram's prayer, we do not read anywhere in the life of Abram that he prayed for Sarah to have children. Can you believe that? It was a great blind spot in the patriarch's life. When God announced that Sarah was going to have a child, she laughed, she laughed. But later they believed. Here is the son of Abraham. And what does he do? We're told verse 21. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. You do not read a phrase like that in the entire life of Abraham. No record at all. But he interceded for the whole pagan court of Abimelech. That they would have children again. I'm saying Isaac had more faith than his father. More trust in God. How long, in, how long is that our children will be much wiser, stronger, holier, more loving, more full of joy and peace than we were? You know, you, you hear people say, oh well, um, Children will never grow more gracious than their parents. What? Why not? More mature? No, they can't grow. That's the level. A father sets a level and his sons cannot become more holy than him. Why not? They say it about pastors, don't they? They say, well, you can judge the quality of the church by the life of the pastor. That... Uh, a church will never become more more holy and more knowledgeable and more wise and more loving than, than the pastor. Why not? Don't you all have the same spirit as, as I have? Don't you all have the same Bible as I have? Don't you have access, every one of you, to the same throne of grace that I have and can ask for mercy and grace to help you in your time of need? We stand in awe of the maturity of our children's faith when we were their age. We were, we were pygmies. We stand in awe of our grandchildren's faith. We didn't have the grace that they had at their age. It's quite wrong for you to say, oh well. Um, parents set the norm and their children won't show more faith. Isaac showed more faith than Abraham. So he prayed for his wife to have a son when he was 60 years of age and they'd be married 20 years without a child. He trusted in God. He had a session of intercession. He could see her. She looked sad one day. And he had a pang in his heart. And he went to a quiet place. He, we're told he meditated in the fields. He went out where there was no one around. And he opened his heart and he cried to God. For his wife. It's a very simple lesson, isn't it? Um, Peter tells married couples that they are heirs together of the grace of life and that their prayers shouldn't be hindered. <laughs> yeah, the old fashioned um, ministers then, they, they, they did family devotions and they prayed in the church. One of them is still alive. He said recently he had never heard his wife pray in private or in public. Well, I felt sorry for him. Because Peter talks about your prayers, plural, not being hindered. And Rebecca had this most blessed of husbands. She had a praying husband who loved her. And the answer to the prayer is immediate. In the same verse, verse 21, the Lord answered his prayer. 
And his wife Rebecca became pregnant. It's impossible for men, isn't it? What do we want? We want the baby. When do we want it now? <laughs> That's arrogance crying out of man's impotence. How different is believing, trusting, submissive prayer when Isaac and Rebecca had what they failed to achieve in 20 years then God granted them when Isaac prayed this prayer you're trusting me I'll give you your heart's desire and Isaac knew Isaac knew that he and his wife were bound to have descendants because God had made it spectacularly clear again and again God had told them now you understand God nowhere makes that promise to every Christian couple he doesn't do that. But he had made it to this couple, to Isaac and Rebecca. And they believed his word. They kept believing it. He said he will do it. And so he will do it. Twenty years will go by. He prayed in accordance with a revealed will. He said, Lord, now you've said, you've promised. You're not a liar. It's time, Lord. And someone says, well, wouldn't God have given them a child anyway if he hadn't prayed? And that's an interesting theological point, isn't it? And it's sort of a yes and no answer that sometimes we infuriatingly give. Yes, God would have. He was committed to provide the seed through Isaac. He wasn't going to let... Isaac's weakness or Rebecca's weakness or a combination of both their weaknesses and prayerlessnesses frustrate his purpose of sending his son into the world one day in the fullness of time join through the umbilical cord back and back to Isaac and Rebecca. Yes, a child. A child was going to be born to them. Then you ask the question, well, why bother to pray? God is going to do what God is going to do. <laughs> yes, he is. He is going to do what he's going to do. Well, let's look at the no. Then we looked at the yes. Let's look at the no of, of the answer. No, in a sense, that it's a wrong way of looking at things. It's a wrong way of looking at things. God has ordained through the, the trusting of Isaac and the praying of Isaac the way that Isaac believed that God would do these things that in no other way he would bring a son into the world for them the seed would come and Isaac knew he couldn't change God's plan it was from all eternity but Isaac could participate in that plan he could how does he do it does he do it by adding his strength to omnipotence well no he had no strength and if he did well almighty God doesn't need it how did Isaac participate in the plan of God trust and obey There's no other way. No other way of participating in God's plans for Aberystwyth and for this congregation and for Wales in 2010. Isaac and Rebecca must trust what God has said that he will give his child and uh, through this child all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Amen, you say. Praise God, you say. You trust God and you obey God. And you show that by, by, by expressing this in prayer and intercession to God. And you continue to remember to sleep together. Which is the biological means of children being born. Isaac, who cannot guarantee Rebecca conceiving, does all that a man has to do. And he trusts that the time will come, the set time, for the promised child to be born. And so he commits this need to the Lord. He involves himself in the promises of God by doing what God tells us to do. Pray without ceasing. 
And so we pray. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Because God is working in us. He gives us a prayer of supplication. He pours out the spirit of prayer and supplication upon us. And so we pray. He works and we work. And so he prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. Paul says, I planted and Apollos watered. But God gave the increase. And that's how all men and women are born into the world. And that's how people are born of the spirit into the kingdom of God. The wind blows where it lists. And so men and women are born into the kingdom. The last thing I want you to see from this passage is that Isaac and Rebekah discovered they were having twins. Verse 22. The babies jostled with each other jostled each other within her and she said what is this happening to me so she went to inquire of the Lord they asked God for a child and they got two and it turned out to be a double blessing because all children are God's reward and double trouble as it needed only one but he got twins And the Holy Spirit tells us the reason for Rebecca's discomfort. He tells us that before she knew it herself. She knew this wasn't the kind of pregnancy that she witnessed in her servant girls when they said, Mom, put your hand here and feel this baby, how alive it is, and feel it kicking. And she had done that and smiled at them. Uh, There wasn't the usual kicking and moving around in her womb. They were tumult. It seemed at times to her there were a couple of wild cats having a fight in there. And it went on and on. There was never a more painful pregnancy than Rebecca's. The word jostled. It means a violent internal commotion. As if the children in the womb were jostling and dueling with one another in the womb. The word is used of crushing another or thrusting at or striking at one another. Did she turn to her husband and she she said, why is this happening to me? He didn't know. He was a prospective father. He'd never been a prospective father before. And he held her hand and he was wonderfully kind and loving, I'm sure. So she went to the Lord. She went for an answer to the Lord. If all is well, why am I like this? So we are introduced now not just to Isaac as a man of faith, but we are introduced to Rebecca as a woman of faith, that she knew Jehovah as her Lord. And she spoke some words to him which are almost impossible to translate in the Hebrew language. It's not a complete sentence. It comes out in gasps and sharp intakes of breath and ouches. As she gulps out words in her pain between the kicks that she's getting from inside her womb. What sort of pregnancy is this? She asked God. The knowing that the promise that she would have a son and knowing that God had answered her prayers and that the the child was the gift of God to her how is God going to answer this prayer it was all well with this pregnancy it's typical isn't it of our lives as Christians in a groaning world isn't it typical we ask for something and we're earnest and then uh, God gives us something and then after a little while we say but why this? Why did you give me it like this, in this form? We've come here um, Sunday nights as we always do, inquiring of the Lord. You know, why, why have things worked out in our lives as they have? Why the losses and the crosses and why the joys and the blessings, they're so undeserved? Why the delays? Why the ill health? Why the troubles? And uh, there's no better place to come for an answer than to come to the house of God and hear the word of God opened up and it just touches us and it answers us again and again. And we get answers here. We get better answers in the future. So Rebecca goes to the Lord and she doesn't know 
what we already know. We know it because we read the text, but she didn't know it, that she's pregnant with twins. And so God answers her like he answers us. Every Lord's Day we'll have some words from him. We'll have teaching, we'll have our, our values and our structure, our thinking, really sorted out again. And God drops the bombshell. He says, you're expecting twins. He says, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. That's, that's the full answer that God gives in verse 23. So, she just doesn't have two twins. She just doesn't have twins fighting like this in the womb. She's got twins that are going to always be fighting. Always, as they grow up. Right through their history. Not just their personal history, but their line. The nations that are going to come from these two patriarchal heads. Nations will come from, and these nations will be separated from one another. And they will be divided, and they will look suspiciously at one another. They will oppose one another. And battle has commenced. And where has it commenced? In the womb of Rebecca. And it's a foretaste of a war, a fighting that's going to go on and on. God tells Rebecca that they're not going to fight to a draw or fight until they're exhausted because there'll be no truce in this campaign. There'll be a victor in this fight one day. The stronger one is going to triumph over the weaker one. And he doesn't tell her that it'll be in a thousand years' time that King David will lead the children of Jacob into battle with the children of Esau in the country of Edom and that they will destroy them. And he doesn't tell her again that it will happen uh, when King Uzziah goes out and defeats the Edomites. He doesn't tell Rebecca that it will be 2,000 years before in the fullness of time then Jesus Christ will come, the son of Jacob. He'll come into the world and he'll defeat the serpent on the cross. But he does say, it started now. It's beginning here. The seed of the serpent is in your womb and the seed of the woman is in your womb. You have in your womb the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. You have Cain and Abel in your womb. And they hate one another. Little wonder the clash is so violent and that you feel no one's ever had a pregnancy like mine. God takes sides. God discriminates. His choice is is not the seed of the serpent. No, he says, not the seed of the serpent. It's the seed of the woman that God supports. Well, you can understand that. But God also sides with the younger one, and that's what we can't understand. The seed of the younger one, the younger one is going to be served by the older one. You think he would cho choose the older one, but the older one he would be entitled to inherit the blessings, but God says, no, no primogenitor here. The older is going to serve the younger. God reverses the normal order of things. You remember how it happened very vividly in, uh, in the life of David. How King Samuel goes there, how the prophet Samuel goes there one day, because God has told him it's one of the uh, sons of uh, David's father, that uh, he's going to choose a king from among them. And so Samuel is looking for the X factor. And they come tall, handsome, athletic, one by one, they cross the stage, and he looks at them, and God says no to everyone. Have you got no more? Well... Just the boy looking after the sheep on the mountain. Bring him down. And God passes by the first, second, third, fourth, fifth. And he chooses David. David is set apart. It's not the flesh that matters. It's not beauty and intelligence and athletic skill. It's no human X factor that matters. It's what God by his spirit decrees. So the child who is not superior in age, but inferior, he is the victor, and the superior one will serve him. 
Salvation is of the Lord. And that's a help to you because you're not very gifted. And you're not the older one and the smart one. You haven't got all the characteristics of leadership that can commend you to God. You're an ordinary man, an ordinary woman. And God's love is set upon ordinary men and women. And aren't we so glad that that is the case? And why does God show his sovereignty in this way? Well, Paul picks it up in the passage I read to you in Romans chapter 9 and verses 10 to 12. Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. And you see that. You see it with increasing clarity. You see it. It hits you again and again. You see it in the life of Abraham. There he is in Ur of the Chaldees and he's absolutely identical in his belief in temples and in his attendance at uh, idols and making sacrifice to them with everybody else in Ur of the Chaldees. He's not a distinctively holy man. He's not vexed in his heart by what he sees. And then God zooms in, hones in on Abram's life and meets with him and confronts him and tells him to leave Ur of the Chaldees, that God is going to have, the God is going to have dealings with Abraham. And his whole life is changed. And he has decided that the second born, Jacob, not the first born, Esau, is going to be the seed. And it's not because Abram and Isaac and Sarah and Isaac are perfect men and women. It's because he takes distinguishing, sovereign, loving initiative in our lives. It's because of the election of grace. That's why we're here tonight. Because he loved us before the foundation of the world. That he gave us to his son. Love them. Care for them. Suffer and die for them. Rise for them. Ever live to intercede for them. That's what he said. So that willingly the son came into the world and loved us. We were like a little baby lying in a field covered in our mother's blood and we were puking and crying and dying and the vultures were already overhead. And God said, live! And God caught you in the most strange places. And God said to you, live. And you've lived until now because of discriminating grace and undeserved love. Jacob wasn't a super boy, was he? The one he chose? He was far from that. He was devious. He was a cheat. He was crafty. We're not told those things about his brother Esau. We're told them about Jacob. But God loved Jacob. And God lets himself be known as the God of Jacob. And so there's hope for you and for me. You remember the man who went to uh, Spurgeon and said to Spurgeon that he didn't like that verse. Jacob, I, I have loved and Esau have I hated. And Spurgeon said to him, he didn't like it either. He had real problems with how God could love Jacob. Well, the man, of course, didn't like the fact that God hated Esau, but there was no problem that Spurgeon had with that, because God is angry with the wicked every day. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, day after day, but God loved Jacob. How perplexing it is. You know, if God had said there's one thing that's essential for you to get to heaven, you've got to do one good work 
absolutely perfectly. That's the condition. One thing you've got to do. And from your heart it's done entirely for the glory of God. And in your mind you do it out of obedience to God. And when God shines the light of his own omniscience, when God puts his, it under his microscope, and he examines every part of that one good deed that you have done, God says, spotless, you may come to heaven. Then you and I know that there would be no hope of heaven if it hung on one perfect deed that you and I would do. Because there is no one who does something absolutely and perfectly good. No, not one. Our good deeds don't pass muster. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So we not only run from our sins, but we run from our good works. And we lodge in Christ. And we find our hopes and our salvation in Jesus only. He is the Savior. He saves us. We do not save ourselves at all. So we flee to him, to the one who on the cross bore our blame and shame, to the one who by his life fulfilled all righteousness for us. And that's where we find the perfect grounds of our righteousness. We find them in Christ. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Here is a God who owes us nothing but has given us everything. He is a God who has given us an abundance without measure. Having Christ we have everything, the Apostle says. So we give all glory to God for loving Jacob like sinners from before the foundation of the world. He knew just how like Jacob we all would be. And yet he loved us. And that's our hope. Lord, bless your word to us tonight now and give us understanding and appreciation of the wonder of thy grace, the wonder of promises that thou hast made that thou wilt fulfill for every single one of thy people for the glorious achievement of Jesus Christ, his life and his death and that's everything to us. Save us for his sake. Help us to love him and serve him with all our might and may. We thank thee that the seed of the woman came and bruised the serpent's head and rose victorious and is with us tonight. Welcome, blessed Saviour, to our gathering. Help us to love and serve thee much better than we've done so far. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.